Good morning, guys. Give me one second to get set up. Uh, we're going to be in Second Peter. So if you guys could flip there, it's page 983. Sorry, uh, one second. I need a timer. Otherwise, things can go badly. One second. Okay. All right. Guys, happy to see you guys. I didn't know I was going to be here until Laura called me on Friday. She said, David, can you come? I said, praise God, I'll make it. So we worked it out. Um, three updates that I asked for your prayer. Update number one, Nanda and I are 26 weeks pregnant. Hey. Okay. Update number two, right? We bought a house in our planting city in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Update number three, um, some of you guys have been asking us about church planting network. So we got into a... Uh, the network that we want to get into is called the Creek Collective. There are 12 churches uh, that are in this program nationwide. It services uh, dis uh, economically distressed communities across the country. So where we live, or uh, where we bought the home in Bridgeport, is very similar to a city like Patterson, do you understand? Um, we're very excited to do the work. Um, I'll send an email out in the summertime. We're in the, we're in the running for some funding from them, which would be very nice, you understand? Um, and I'll send an email about whether or not we get it or not. But in that email, I will also include a request for your funds, you understand? Because, <laughs> yeah, listen guys, <laughs> just being honest, um, to say, please come and support the work. Uh, in, in that way, we really appreciate it. Um, please stand for the reading of God's word, and we'll get right to business. So we're in with 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. When you're there, if you could say amen. 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 Okay. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power, Jesus is, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, his glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason... Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, or brotherly kindness, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities, those seven things, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Before I pray, um, Lord said to me, um, just preach something that you've been preaching to your church. And that was a little complicated, but I thought to myself, what, is it, what has been on my heart? What have I been communicating to my people through different means? And it was essentially this idea. It was the idea that, hey, since we're going to go plant this church in Bridgeport, a burden that's been on my heart is, Dave, what are you... What are you offering people? You know, when you, when you get up there, you, you know, you start services and, you know, you got people singing and whatever, whatever. What are you giving to people? And it was a really important question for me to ask myself that I've been wrestling through is because I think about my own life. I see my parents getting older. I see friends around me. 
I got a mortgage now. I realize a lot of us miserable. <laughs> Not in connection to the mortgage, just in general, right? <laughs> mortgage aside, right? There's a lot of misery. And the misery that we face as human beings is, is distinct from knowing that we're miserable. In fact, I'm far more convinced that we are miserable because we don't realize how miserable we are, right? We, we play this life at such a level that we often don't recognize just how much we're needing and just how much what we're grabbing for is a counterfeit for who we really need. Who we really need, not what we really need, because who we really need is God, right? And so I didn't want to come, and neither does my church planning team want to come to Bridgeport and play church. We want to know that we had something for miserable men like us, something that met a need. And so we've been trying to cover our foundations and asking ourselves, this Christianity that we so believe is it what people need? Or have we somehow evolved in 2022? And we've rejoiced in our exploration of the word of God, not that we ever questioned it to the point of stopping the work, but to say again and to double down and say, yes, man needs Christianity because Christianity is the power of God to save souls, you understand? And it was verse three that grabbed me for our time today. What does verse three say? Verse three says, but by his divine power, he has given us everything we need according to life and godliness. And so my goal today is to do really two things. It is to present what Christianity is in three different points, and then to explain how each of these points, each of these things that make up what Christianity is, points to a need or multiple needs that we have. That we can draw a straight line for anybody who's wondering, what is it that these Christians believe? Why do they strangely gather at 8.30 in the morning to praise God? And how does that meet a need for me on Monday morning? You understand me? Because he says, but by his, meaning Jesus, by his divine power, he, Jesus, has given us everything we need for life and godliness. I know about myself, and therefore I know about you. We're needy people. We have deep needs, greater than we can really express and often far greater than we can even see. Let's pray. Holy God, we praise thy name. Lord of all, we bow before thee. All on earth thy scepter claim. All in heaven above adore thee. Infinite thy vast domain. Everlasting is thy reign. Spare thy people, Lord, we pray, from a thousand snares surrounded. Keep us without sin today. Never let us be confounded. Lord, we put our trust in thee. Never, Lord, abandon me. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, through we name thee. While in essence only one, undivided, Lord, we claim thee. And adoring, we bend the knee as we sing the mystery. What have we come to do? Why did we gather this morning? What does the Apostle Paul say? My, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Lord, would you visit us as you promised, where two or three are gathered in my name. Jesus says, you said you'd be here. Don't leave me. Don't leave them. Be with us in such a way that we are so changed. Not changed so that we don't engage our will to do more labor for you, to seek you further, but changed so that we are more willing. For your word says, Jesus, you said in the temple, you said, if anyone is willing to do my will, he will know of the teaching." How glorious is that? If anyone is so willing that to know you is not a matter of knowledge, but it's a matter of heart disposition, if we so desire, but Lord, our problem is we so seldom desire. So come down with your power. Open up our hearts, as you said, and put your worship on our hearts that we would know you, which is to know eternal life. Amen. So here's the main proposition, three points. What is Christianity? Christianity is one, to receive a faith or true knowledge. Peter uses them as synonyms in this pericope. Faith or true knowledge that Jesus is God and Savior. That's number one. Number two, Christianity is what? It is to trust that Jesus is Savior of the world and that he's made promises. Number three, what is Christianity? Christianity is to make every effort to imitate him. Number one. This is the claim. What is Christianity? 
Notice, guys, with me, if you look at the verse, we're going to look at verses 1 to 3. Let me read it one more time. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. I'll stop there. That's all I need to do. Peter says something remarkable. This is his last letter before he dies. You know, we have 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And he says something so easily, without skipping a beat, that after he died, many men and women have absolutely stumbled over. Councils of great theologians have stumbled over. And it was right there in that second section where he says, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's actually quite rare in the Bible that it's put so plainly that he believes that Jesus is God. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not talking about the Father. He's not talking about the Spirit. And we find this fundamental tenet of Christianity that to be a Christian is is to have received a knowledge, to have been implanted in your heart with a trust that Jesus is God. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 9, verse 5. He says, the Messiah has come, Jesus Christ, who is God over all. Can you imagine how destabling that was to the synagogue or to the Jews in Tyrannus Hall? It's so destabling that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, this Jesus, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness, but to us, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, I have to prove to you guys that Jesus is God. Now, I know some of y'all personally, I know many of y'all love Jesus, so I know you're thinking, why do I need to do this? But I think it's vitally important. And I'll explain why after. But let me do it first. Let me prove that Jesus is God. First and foremost, there is a God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God. It is absolutely fascinating that we are deposited with a book and that this book doesn't start with us. In fact, it takes a whole 26 verses after, or 25 verses afterwards for us to get any mention in the Bible. What God is trying to say first and foremost is you start with me. Begin with me. But we know what happened. I see on YouTube, y'all in Genesis, right? I see (laughs) y'all just, I was Cain and Abel, but two weeks back, garden, right? And look, what happens? We had a relationship with this God and we broke that relationship. And now, we find ourselves, and I find in amazing fashion, even in 2022, quibbling as to whether or not does God exist? My friends, my friends, I hope as Christians we are not daunted, dissuaded, discouraged, caught fumbling about the question, does God really exist? I find we can over-intellectualize these things. Let me keep it basic to you, with you. John Newton, wonderful physicist, astronomer, was sitting in his office, and one of his friends, who was an atheist, walks in, and he sees John Newton playing with a solar uh, planetarium, you know, those little modules. And his friend goes, oh my gosh, did you make that? John Newton goes, no, I didn't make it, he just showed up. The friend goes, stop playing. Come on, you're being ridiculous. How'd you make that? He says, I didn't make it, it showed up. The friend goes, John, what are you getting at? John turns to him seriously and goes, well, that's what you think about this world. This world that's so creative and so wonderful. This world that's far more intelligent than this solar planetarium that you think is so great. You think it just showed up. But Thomas Aquinas had already put forth in his five points on the existence of God. One of them was a cosmological proof. He said, listen, this world is so amazing. It is so well-structured that it has to have a designer. Michio Kaku, one of the leading physicists in the world, he's in the city. He just came out with a book called The God Equation. He's trying to posit this idea that there's something called string theory. And he says at the end of his book, he says, listen, I'm an agnostic. And the reason why I'm an agnostic, meaning he doesn't know whether there's a God out there, is because he has to say that he finds too much evidence in the world of intelligence for him to deny that this can't be an accident. There is more burden of proof on someone who does not believe that there is God on their side than on our side. If somebody doesn't believe that there is a God, just just say to them, look around you, my friend. There is a God, someone that put us here and created all of this. There's absolutely no denying this. But the next question is, is Jesus God? Well, in some sense, that's harder to prove. 
The Bible makes the argument in two different ways, indirectly and directly, that Jesus is God. One, indirectly. God the Father says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. He says, I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. You know how many songs we just sang to Jesus? Then God should be upset. <laughs> he should be very angry <laughs> that we've just been praising Jesus and not his name. He's very zealous about his name. Uh, indirectly, it's so beautiful, guys. In the book of Revelation, in two chapters, Revelation 19.10 and Revelation 22.9, John the Apostle is receiving this revelation from an angel, and when he gets out of the revelation and he still sees the angel, he bows to the floor. And the angel says this. He says, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. Don't do that. But what do we find with Jesus in John chapter 9? John chapter 9, Jesus heals a blind man. He finds the blind man, and he says to the blind man, do you believe in the Son of Man? The blind man goes, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus says, I, he says, you have seen him, and he is the one who has healed you. And then the text says, and the blind man worshiped him. He worshiped him. There was no resounding sound from heaven with God the Father saying, don't do that. No, he worshiped him. That same John who was told not to worship an angel in the book of Revelation, in the book of Luke, Luke 24, Jesus shows up in a room. He breaks bread with them. He teaches them. And then when he leaves, it says they worshiped him and then went to the temple. Now, that's got to be some real craziness. If, it's, if Jesus isn't God, how are you going to worship him then go to temple? <laughs> that don't make no sense. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They're, what they've understood in their mind is he's God. To worship him is he's God. Do you understand? Now, for us Christians, we take this as basic fact, but I'll give you one more proof directly from the Bible. Why did Jesus die? What do they say in John chapter 10, verse 31 to 33? They picked up stones to stone him. Jesus says, I have shown you many good works from my father. For which of these do you stone me? They reply, for a good work we do not stone you, but because you, being a mere man, make yourself out to be... God. John 8, 24, what does Jesus say? Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. Who's he? God. One more story for someone who says, but that's the Bible. There was a famous dictator. He, he was a Caesar of his day named Napoleon Bonaparte. And I personally don't like him, and I kind of jeer at him. Being a Haitian man, we ruined his life. 1804, my ancestors revolted against him, did away with him, made him sell you guys, or not you guys, but Americans, the Louisiana, you know, Louisiana and over there. And listen, I don't like the guy, but he said something that was absolutely true. When he was on exile in St. Helens, an island, he had a friend named Henri Gatien Bertrand. And he asked his friend Henri, he said, Henri, do you believe that Jesus is God? And he did what many people do with the question. He fumbled it. You know, I don't, I don't know if he's God. I think, he, I think he's a good moral teacher. I think there's a lot to learn from him. You know, quite frankly, I think the world would be a better place if we listened to him, you know? Napoleon's reply, I know men, and I tell you Jesus Christ was not a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions, that resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and other religions the distance of infinity. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself, Napoleon speaking, founded empires. But on what, this is such a beautiful point, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon sheer force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this, hour, hours, uh, at this hour, millions of men will die for him. In every other existence but that of Christ, how many imperfections? 
Do you see his argument? He is alone. A man who ruled the world was alone on an island by himself with no one to command. And he said, I did that by sheer force. And because I'm not around, they don't obey me anymore. This man has been dead for over a thousand years. And he has more followers in his death than in his life. He must be a god. Do you follow the logic? It is incredible. Jesus is God. Now, Again, I'm making the argument. Why? Because I'm saying this idea when when Peter says so casually, God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. What is this idea that Jesus is God? This, This idea that Christianity is believing that Jesus is God. What does that have to do with man's needs? Another way to ask the question is, what are we left without if he isn't God? I find this to be a gorgeous point. Saints, Move all your, your, your thoughts on religion aside and ask yourself, isn't it true that we as human beings have a natural propensity to worship other people? We, we will worship any superior human being that we can find. We may hide it, but we will worship it. We may differ on who we consider superior, but we will worship somebody. Somebody. We may not even know that we're worshiping that person, but quite frankly, we are modeling our lives after them. You know, Nander and I, we were doing some work on our house, looking at a renovation. I step into the renovation world, and the word, the, the, this name, I keep hearing resounding in my ears like a gong, Joanna Gaines, Joanna Gaines, Joanna Gaines, Joanna Gaines. Oh, you know, you know, fix her up at this, da 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 And I'm looking on Instagram, and women and men, what's that pink color, da 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 and just dying for the kitchen island. You understand? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes, be with me. I know you know. (laughs) But have you stopped back for a second? Do you see this? Do you see this devotion? This is devotion. One woman puts barn doors on a house. Every barn doors. You see what I'm saying? You do. We follow. We love it. We buy it. We like it. We see it in Target. Snatch it. Devotion, y'all, I, I ma- I'm making a joke to ease the room, <laughs> but let it sit home, okay? We worship those we consider superior because we see her and we see she has a touch and she has a style that some like and we say we want that and we, we follow and we venerate and we debate and bicker about it. We all have this natural propensity to worship those individuals, those people we consider to be superior. So how genius of it was for God to make it so that we would no longer commit idolatry, to make himself a man. Mm. To make himself a man. You. You. You don't know how to worship me. You're in the dark. You don't understand me. You've lost sight of me in the garden when you ate that forbidden fruit and I banished you and you worship men. I'll make myself a man so you can imitate and you can follow. Do you understand the point? How does Christianity meet man's needs? Man is going to worship man. God made himself a man. Christian, what do you think about Jesus today? Hmm, I'll move. Point number two, what is Christianity? Christianity is to trust that Jesus is Savior of the world and know what he has promised. Look with me, verse three and four. Verse three and four reads, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, his glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises. He has given us these precious promises so that through them, through these promises, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Now, notice what the verse is saying. The verse is saying, that through Jesus' promises, we can, escape, we can get a divine nature and escape this world. Someone might say, I thought we were already saved. The Bible is very interesting. It talks about this idea of being saved in three different ways. Christians are people who have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved. We have been saved in that Jesus has atoned for our sins, finally and perfectly. 
We are being saved in that he's making us holy and like himself day after day by the power of the Spirit. And we will be saved in that one day the wrath of God will come upon this world. And he will make sure we have no part in it. Now, when Jesus comes to do this, he makes himself the savior of the world. Now, why? Look down at your Bibles and look at what it says. There is corruption in the world, and this corruption is caused by what? Evil desire. Evil desire. See, what Jesus does is he says, he looks upon men and he says, they suffer from this condition of lust. And when I say lust, I don't mean sexual lust. When the Bible says the word lust, it's not always meaning sexual lust. It means an inordinate desire, a desire out of order, out of proportion. And what's happening here is he's saying, just like James says, who was his biological brother in his letter in chapter 4, the problem with us is that we have these desires, this longing, this urge to do that which we should not be doing And Jesus has come to save us from this. Now, how has he come to save us from this? Well, he's come to save us from this with promises. I'm going to give you guys one unconditional promise that Jesus gives. It's this. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 40. It reads, I will make an everlasting covenant with them, all who believe, all who receive true knowledge, all who receive faith. One more time. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good and I will put the fear of me or the worship of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Let me read it again. I will make an everlasting covenant. The word covenant, guys, when you read the word covenant, think contract or think promises. I will make an everlasting contract or I'll make an everlasting promise with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. What's the promise here? The promise here is this. He's saying, in this new promise that I have with you, with anybody who believes in me, I'm making the promise that I will forgive every and all sin that would terminate this promise, that he's going to do it. Let me put it a different way. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he gained riches from God. And in that parcel of riches that were now his, he could dole it out to us or keep it to himself. He has decided in his sovereignty to dole it out to us. And the prime gift in this wonderful box of heavenly goodness is that I will forgive every sin that would separate you from me. In fact, I will so work in you so mightily that you won't separate from me and never want to separate from me. See, this condition, guys, is absolute. It is unconditional. If you look at the passage again, and I'm sorry, I don't have it on the board for you, but if you look for the passage again, he says, I will once. He says, I will twice. He says, I will three times. And then finally he says, because I will do these three things, they will not leave me. It's on him. Now, how does this meet man's need? How does this understanding that Jesus is the Savior of the world and that he's made a promise to forgive every and all sin that would break your relationship with him, how does that meet man's need? Well, a couple things. Christianity offers a faith, a religion, that is greater than your obedience. Let's imagine you did something foul in your marriage. You messed up. I'll leave your imaginations to decide what it is that you had done, but you messed up. Your marriage is tender right now. It's sensitive. What you're asking your spouse to do is to trust that you will not do what you did again. But your spouse has to wonder something, and rightly so, which is, How can I trust that you who did such a thing won't do it again? I can't hop into your body. I can't change you. 
what assurance do I have that you're changed when I've committed my life to you already? And that to leave this arrangement would be destabilizing for you, for me, and if we have children, definitely for our kids. Do you see the problem that we have as humans? Do you see the needs that we have and this issue of trust and the inability that we have? Isn't it incredible, guys, that with God, when we do him wrong, he never has to ask the question, how do I know that they won't do it again? He instead says, I will make them not do it again. I will work in them so powerfully that they won't want to do it again. And that holiness and that goodness pervades through your entire life. Somebody once asked me, do you, David, ever worry that you will destroy your marriage or that Nader might cheat on you? And I looked at my friend. He was about to get married. I looked at my friend, and God gave me some good words, and I said to him, we would both have to cheat on God first. Before we violate one another, we got to cheat on him, and he's made a promise to me that he will keep me until the last day. Do you not need that? You don't need it. I know you need it. I know, <laughs> I know you need it. I know you need an assurance that you can be good when you realize there's so much evil desire inside of you. I know you need an assurance that there's a power outside of you that can propel you to like the things that you don't like by nature and hate the things that you love by nature. My goodness, what is the madness of this life? Has this Bible, guys, ever betrayed me? No. Have I ever felt bad after reading the Bible? No. Is it always, almost always hard for me to wake up every morning and read it? Yes. How? But there is sin in my life that I don't like it. I wish to not do it. I did it again. I despise it. It hurts me. It hurts other people. I'm back again. What confidence do I have that he made me a promise, that he's the savior of the world, and he's tying his honor to my faithfulness? That's Christianity. And when we're talking to our friends about coming to church, and they're like, nah, you know, I don't think I need it. You say, wait a minute. You don't need it? You don't need an assurance that you can love what is good and hate what is bad? You don't want somebody more powerful than you, omnipotent, omnipresent, working in your life? You don't need that? You don't have a need for virtue and high morals to keep your marriage and your children and your home you can tell them flat out, you're lying. You need Christianity. Last point. Flip the page. The last point is a conditional promise. And I'm going to take this point very carefully because it, it has incredible relevance. You see, in verses 1 to 4, Peter was talking about what God has done. Verses 5 to 11, he says... Since God has done this, you are to do this. Let me read it very briefly. He says, verse 5, For this very reason, because I said all that I said, because you believe that Jesus is God, because you believe that he has forgiven you and he's working in you mightily to obey him and he will keep you until the last day. For this very reason, in your faith, apply all diligence. Supply all diligence. And add, he lists seven things. Virtue, goodness, or moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. He says, for if these things are yours, if you, these seven qualities are yours and are increasing, they will render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, for he who lacks these seven qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Do you see the connection there? That to not grow is to forget that you've been made new. He says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent or make every effort or put it to your highest priority 
to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, these seven things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, what is the claim? The claim is this. What is Christianity? We say that Christianity is to believe that Jesus is God. We say that Christianity is to believe that he is Savior of the world and that he has made us wonderful promises. The last thing, Christianity is to make every effort to look like him. I'm pressed because I don't have much time left, and this point is large. So I'm going to try to uh, this, okay? <laughs> All right? Yeah. The promise that I just told you about before was unconditional. God will keep you until the end. This promise is conditional. In verse 8 and verse 11, there's the condition for if. And here we find something that the Christian church has lost and absolutely needs to recapture. We need to recapture which promises are conditional and which, is our, which are unconditional. We know the promise of unconditional love, unconditional election, that he has saved us. He will bring us home to the end. So we know that in this life, there are two things we will not have. On one side, we will not have perfection. We will always be flawed in this world. And on the other side, we know that he will keep us and we will not commit apostasy. We will not leave Jesus Christ. We will not forsake the name. But this is a wide field. And as you go this way to perfection is the happier you are. And as you go this way to apostasy is the more miserable you are. He is making no promise that he will keep you closer to perfection. He is saying in this passage that if you don't add to your faith these seven things... You will find yourself here and may find that you were never in part of this at all. I'll give you two examples of people in the Bible who are like this. Guys, you don't ever read the Apostle Paul and wonder if you're a Christian? You don't ever read, guys, sometimes I read the Apostle Paul and I'm like, I must not be saved because he's godly. <laughs> I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I preach, I will not be disqualified. I'm like, I know beat my body. I, you, know, you know what I mean? And you ever read about one character? I think about a guy like Samson. Have you ever read the story of Samson? I was shocked to find in Hebrews chapter 11 that he's in the kingdom. How? What did he do to get in? <laughs> Have you ever read the story of Lot? How he gave up his daughters to be raped by evil men? And then when the angel was trying to rescue him out of Sodom and Gomorrah, was complaining and wanting to stay. And then... Only for Peter to say, this same Peter in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, to call him righteous a lot? And I'm thinking, how? Where was this righteousness? And you, 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 you learn a wonderful thing. Oh, this Christianity, guys, is a wide field. God has promised in Christianity, through Jesus, he has promised grace to prevent and to preserve our souls from conscious crippling sins. He has given us access to not commit conscious, crippling sins, fornication, idolatry, adultery, effeminacy, homosexuality, thievery, covetousness, drunkenness, reviling, swindling. He will keep you from it, but it will not be automatic. You must apply your will. You must grow in these seven things. That's what he's saying. And this explains the vast difference between Christians this is so vitally important, guys, because we do we not understand that if you keep walking in soul-crippling sins, yes, you may be saved, but you may never feel saved. You can commit sins in this life. I am sure there are many pastors who committed adultery on their wives, lost their churches, who we will see in the kingdom that day. But they don't, but, but man, they feel it. Is David, King David not in the kingdom? But did his child not die because of his sin? Did he not have to live with that all the days of his life? Somebody says to me, David, why are you making this point? Listen to the larger point. Don't you want to be happy? God is saying, I'm not promising you that you're not going to commit conscious crippling sins unless you grow in these seven things. How does this meet man's need? I find this point to be beautiful. 
The idea that we are to make every effort to be like him, this is Christianity. How does that meet man's need? What about man makes that appropriate? What about man makes being like Jesus perfect for us? Guys, we need a labor worthy of our souls. Let me say it one more time. Do you know how incredible your will is as a human being? Do you know how powerful you are as a human being? Your ability to work, your ability to think, your ability to create, your ability to, to grow, excuse me. The Bible is saying there's no greater endeavor that's worth the value of your will than growing in holiness. Uh, Kevin Durant is an incredible basketball player. He's like seven foot tall. He's easily the greatest basketball player in the world. After he won his first championship, he says he had a fun night, went back home, woke up the next morning, and felt empty. Are you guys following the, Russian, um, the Winter Olympics? What has happened with that, that, that right? Russia. What has happened with the, these Russian girls? The girl who took gold, you know what she said? She said, it felt nice, but I feel empty. Her whole life was engaging in a labor that wasn't worth her soul. What does the Apostle Paul say? He says... All who run in a race, don't they run for a prize? Run in a way so that you may win. For some run for a perishable wreath, like an Olympic gold medal. But he, Paul says, run for that which is imperishable. How does man, why does man need this? Man needs this, guys, because it solves our pursuit for happiness. I'll say it differently. Guys, do you notice that everybody's looking for happiness? But do you also notice that happiness is not a button? You can't push happiness directly. You have to approach happiness indirectly. Show me a happy man. Show me a happy woman, and I will show you a virtuous person. Show me an unhappy person, and I will show you an unvirtuous person. You see, see, we want to be happy, but we want to be happy in a way that is so direct that happens almost like a blood transfusion, just make me happy. And the Bible says, no, holiness before happiness. And don't you see that this makes sense in your life? Don't you see that when you're right with God, things can be falling apart, but there's the joy of the Lord is my strength? Oh, do people not need that? Tell me. Ask your friends, do we not need that? So I'll close with this. What is Christianity? Saints, Christianity is to believe that Jesus is God, is to be that he's the savior of the world, and that he has made us promises. And it is to make every effort to look like him. My plea to you guys this morning is to receive this word. Ask yourself, does, does Christianity meet my needs? It does. And if your needs today are not met, as mine so often, I feel like they so often are, not met. Just remember, it is not a lack with God, but in our lack of our perception of God. Receive this, know this. Christian, don't you see? There's a God, he's made us promises that we take by faith. Know that. Third thing, Christian, live this. I challenge everyone here to put on your board those seven things. Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, and put below all of them faith. Faith is the foundation. And ask yourself every day, am I growing in one of these seven things? And when you find yourself miserable and upset and unhappy in the Lord, just say, in which of these areas am I declining? And you'll run well. Last one, offer this. Tell people that Jesus is everything they need. He is everything you need. When we get to Bridgeport in May and we settle down and we start this church, me and my team will move around that city with the confidence that through the message of Jesus Christ and his power, we can give you everything according to life and godliness. There is no lack in the house of God, for our God is in the heavens. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Only a God like you is worthy of our praise, all our hope and faith. Only the king of all kings. Wow. There's no issue with Christianity. Oh, no. It meets our need. It meets our need. 
Father God, I'm not sure where every soul is today in a specific way, but I'm sure in a general way, we all need more of you. We all need more of you. You promised, Father God, that if we would open up our mouths wide, you would fill it. We know our, our hearts to be cavernous. Fill us with Jesus. Fill us with Jesus. That we would be more than content. We would have joy inexpressible and full of glory. Because though we have not seen him, we love him. And though we do not see him now, we believe in him. Amen.